at first I was like, yes, or whatever. And then the more like I started watching stuff on, I was like, holy sh- dude, this is ridiculous. So, so what's, what's, what's making you feel that way? I mean, it, it's kind of follow on to Tesla, but they're, it's like the next step towards meat space GPT, because in order to get the video to come out, right. They basically have to build in the, you know, a human equivalent physics model. Like, you know, we all have a physics model that runs kind of in the back of our brain that you don't really think about it, but you understand based on your experience in the world, how physics works. Like you see how, how does a pop fly ball fly? How does a car interact? And, you know, you build up and train these things over time. And then we, you know, use science and we try and figure out, okay, what's the math behind how all of that works. Um, But like, that's not how the vast majority of people over history or animals or, you know, animals don't know what's the arc of a parabola of this thing that's flying through the air, but they can sure as shit catch something. And that's because, you know, evolution and biology has created these incredible neural networks that are able to take vision data and compress it into an underlying structural understanding of how objects move in 3D space. And that is being reproduced by Sora in order to, like, if you want to know how something appears in space, we have to actually know how it travels through space. Like you have to develop a deep understanding of a three-dimensional world and all of the physics that's associated with that. And obviously, you know, it's got issues, you know, it's not perfect yet. It doesn't simulate everything, but basically what I saw was we have the method to do this. Now, once again, it's just a matter of enough videos fed into a big enough computer to develop a physics simulator. And then once you have it, you can distill it down to a little tiny neural network that could run on almost any device and be a essentially perfect portable physics simulator that runs in close to real time for any possible use case that you could imagine up for such an insane thing. Okay. So let me just say back to you in my small brain way, just to make sure I got what you just said. Okay. So Sora, the open AI thing that does the video simulation thing, or like, you know, you type something into Sora and it creates a video based on what you said, you know, a woman walking down to Tokyo downtown was one of the videos they were showing, right? For it to learn how to do that, for it to be able to do that, it needs to have a uh, a, a, a sort of a copy of real world physics uh, in a way by ingesting, I'm guessing, video of real world physics. And then it can generate a model that says, OK, this is this if if a object that was shaped like a human were to move its lower limbs in this manner, then this is the type of movement I would expect to result from the upper body and if they swing their arms this is you know what i would expect to happen and the way the light reflects off of the buildings on the on the ground with the water so it's basically so it's it's a simulation of reality it needs to it needs to create a simulation of reality for it to create accurate looking videos of reality yep exactly and it has to you know it's doing that by creating a neural net that kind of simulates that and in what they're doing, like our, our neural net that simulates that is the quality test, because if it generates video and it passes what a human would say, yes, that is real or no, that is not real. Then it has the, the quality of the simulation that has been generated is ab- at or above the quality of the simulation that human brains would generate. It's a mind fuck, dude. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Okay, so then, so then you mentioned something about so MeetSpace GPT. For those that are not familiar, uh, 
Hans coined this term with, that basically describes a like a chat GPT alternative to reality, which is what this simulation of the real world would be, would be a meat space GPT. So Sora is literally a meat space GPT in a way, like the early innings of it. Um, and then, so you were talking briefly about what Tesla is doing with with uh, its AI system. So in theory, what AI, what Tesla, an, an, an analogy of how a different company might be approaching this potentially is that with Tesla gathering a bunch of video data through its cars, it is also capturing a subset, let's say, of reality, uh, of, of the real world physics, you know, how cars break, how cars accelerate, how humans go into, um, you know, uh, into, um uh intersections how they how they move around the walkways how objects fall off of a pickup truck how rain comes down um how the the sun creates different shadows on the ground right so all these things are physics based uh results of our reality that are projected onto the camera system which the video captures and then tesla uses that data to uh, teach the car how to navigate through those areas. But by default, they're also building a, a meet space GPT <laughs> because they have a subset of reality. It's just that subset is on the roads, whereas Sora, the subset would be whatever fee, uh, video you give it. Is that a fair? Okay, got it. Um, okay, so that's that's wild to think about because I thought the way Sora worked was like, I didn't make the connection of the physics stuff because I thought it was just, you put a, a video in the, in the system or, or a bunch of video in the system. And it's like, Oh, this is how a human walks. And then it's just like, okay, this is how a human walks. But for it to be able to uh, account for every permutation of, of a human walking in different scenarios, it needs to create a model for what reality for, 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 um, the place where the human would actually make those movements. And so that when the movements are made is not like some wacky thing. Like I saw one of the videos with like the woman moving their hands. I know MKBHD did like a little threat and I saw the video of like, like the hands look, what the hell are they doing kind of thing? That's more like, that's more like ensuring that you get like, you know, the wrist movements down and how humans typically move, move their hands and stuff. Uh, maybe that's different, but. Well, it's the same. So, yeah, it's I would say that in that scenario, the model is not good yet, but it will get like they have a lot of the fundamentals and the foundations. And the trick that I think that is um, really it popped for me that OpenAI is doing that is also has a direct correlation to the development of FSD is the the camera position and field of view. Being able to manipulate that in space is what forces these models to have to generate a very robust three-dimensional understanding because if you have to look at the same scene from this perspective over here and this perspective over here and this perspective over here, and for all of those perspectives, to actually look like it is the same fundamental thing that you're looking at just from, you know, from a different angle, then that's where you're, you're transcending from two dimensions into three dimensions. And now you have to have not just three dimensions, but three dimensions that are consistent across the different views. And so the ability to manipulate the camera angle in Sora is a big part of you know creating and i think even sam altman said that what they have created with sora is essentially a physics simulation engine or there's a component of that that's involved in what it is that they've created and one of the things that they don't have in sora is you know the ability for whatever that thing is to then interact with the world directly like it is pulling in video data that is collected by a passive observer camera. And, you know, the thing that's interesting about full self-driving is that it's a system that obviously has the ability to observe the world, but it is also moving through the world and affecting the world as it acts. And so it is an agent 
that is acting in the world and observing the interactions, you know, as it goes, which is definitely a whole nother level. Um, but I think all of it is just really realizing there's a lot of human, the, like the way that our minds work, that we take for granted, that's very complex, that for the first time in history, like computation has been able to do a lot of things, but then there's been a lot of things that it just couldn't do. And physics, so I, I would say one of the first things that tipped me off in this direction was um, reading the DeepMind paper recently on uh, GraphCast where they DeepMind has created a neural network that can simulate weather as good and actually better than the best previous systems that we had. So there are like <clears throat> there's a couple of ways to simulate physics and they're all difficult and the we have basically there are only 3 weather simulators that use traditional computers in the world. And so to create a, a simulation of like hardcore math, that's all going to be either calculus or, you know, differential equations or um, even discrete numerical net methods, which is what these end up being. Basically all that to say, there's a bunch of mathematicians who had to come up with a bunch of exact formulas, and then they have to figure out how to mesh all these exact formulas together to simulate how something's going, like how the weather, something as complex as the weather that has so many variables is going to change over time. And it's just not like there's too many variables. It's hard to do that. And because the system is so big and there's so many variables, it takes forever. Like it would take a day for that whole simulation to run. And DeepMind created a neural network that could do essentially the same job. And it could run in a fraction of the time on a fraction of the overall amount of compute and produce a result that was a little bit worse in the short term. But you could forecast in like 10 minute chunks and you could run a series of those. And once you get out, a certain distance, I can't remember if it was 30 minutes or an hour or whatever, then the quality of the forecast is actually better using GraphCast than it is using the traditional methods. So the traditional methods are better for like, I know exactly what's going to happen next. But then because it takes so long to generate that result, and it's so many computers, and so much time, then it, you can't run that fast enough to be able to maintain that accuracy from now over the next, you know, 24 hours. Um, and so, and then you can't, you really can't go far into the future. Like the, that's the one thing that the graph cast was able to do is it was able to go farther into the future. And so that was like the first inkling to me that neural networks are going to take over more and more and more physics based simulation work and we're going to get better results from them and they're going to get faster and cheaper and easier and, and be able to apply in more areas and so now like that same thing is we're seeing it come into video and just further like further augment neural nets ability to understand physics or for us to use those neural nets to generate like a a useful work out of an understanding of how a physics interaction is going to transpire. Which is interesting to think about because, you know, a neural network is is analogous to a human brain. And so <laughs> like the thing that is best at figuring out what reality is going to do is using a thing that closely resembles a human brain. Right? Is that is that way is that way too stupid to think about or I feel like No, I mean it to me it makes you know, it makes sense. Like the way that we have figured out how to do this is not very energy efficient and it's not very time efficient. And one of the things that biology has optimized for is energy efficiency and being able to make, yeah, a, a very snap judgment when necessary um, that is very highly accurate. Like 
all things considered. You know, your mind's ability to react to a perceived danger before you even know what it is that you are reacting to is bananas insane. And the way that biology has solved this issue is all with neural nets and multimodal sensor input. So you can hear, you can see, you can smell, and the combination of, and then you can, you know, feel um, the combination of all those things. And honestly, like you can even taste something that's in the air. Like, so all five of your senses can all receive valid and independent sensory input about the environment around you. And literally any one of those five senses can alert you to danger and prime you for action, like in fractions of a second. And all of that operates on neural net hardware. And, and that is, dude, so, okay. So everything, everything you just said, and like, it makes so much sense, uh, to think about when it comes to why this technology is so groundbreaking, you know, it's just, it still feels very early, early innings. And I think maybe the results of the early innings is not giving a lot of people, uh, maybe the, the confidence that this is what's coming. But to me, it really seems like these kinds of uh, developments in the arena is really leading to a very obvious outcome, which is I don't think this technology is a bubble. I don't think it's one of those things where um, <laughs> uh, that, that it's not going to play out the way it, people think it's going to play out. I think it's coming and I think many people have said this too, right? This, this is not just me saying it. I'm, I'm just saying basically what, what other people have said that are really close to the space. But I think there's more and more proof that that is saying that not only is this going to be completely transformational for society, like absolutely, completely, world-shatteringly crazy, but it's also coming way faster than a lot of people thought. Because, you know, the, the, <laughs> the one, again, the video that MKBHG put up yesterday of that Will Smith eating spaghetti meme using AI, and then a year later, we have a near photorealistic video that was generated from a prompt, right? We're already there in a year's time. And then you layer on top of that, you know, the work we've been doing with Eleven Labs and the voice, the voice uh, AI model, which a lot of people on this channel love you guys so much, but boy, have you guys been failing the reverse Turing test. <laughs> this is AI. No, it's not. This is not AI. Yes, it is. <laughs> so that's proof, right? So that's like a subset of the technology that's already working. Then we have the video one that's starting to, to become a thing, right? Then we know that the video one, the bones of the video one that's working is also a simulator for reality. And you think about, okay, what are the other things that are going to come out of that? Uh, you know, having a simulation of reality. And then you think about, okay, which companies are best equipped to develop those kinds of technologies. And the fact that when one company reaches that level, another company seems to reach that level within six months or like even three months. Like, so OpenAI's got the Sora thing. And then in three, six months time, what's Bard going to have? You know, what is some, what's Mid Journey going to have or whatever, whatever these other companies are. And it feels like, and it feels like this uh, achieving the technological threshold of being able to generate that type of content, it seems like that piece of it is extremely repeatable and it doesn't seem like it's a moat. It's the data that you have access to when, when you layer that underneath the model that you've built and the data that feeds it is really the separation between these companies. But it, it, and, and then so, so then to me, what, what it feels like we're going towards is because there's so much promise for this technology that like you remember like six eight months ago however long it's, it was when they had that piece of paper that said we should slow down ai development you remember that thing that feels like a thousand years ago <laughs> and just looking at all these developments that are happening now it's, it feels like it feels like the not only is the race on and accelerating but it feels like the the inevitable outcome that's going to be here because of this technologies is going to be here a lot faster than people think, which gives me a lot of confidence about things like FSD. It gives me a lot, a lot of confidence about, about things like, you know, and I don't know if this is a good thing. AI generated content being better and being better than 99% of all content in about two years time. If it feels like, 
you know, and then you, you keep fast, you keep moving forward with that. And, it, you know, I don't know. You, yes, you're shaking your head with my last statement there. What do you think? Just time, like it'll happen. But I, I don't know that two years, like there's a lot of, we're still at early stages and we can see the seeds of like something that is going to work. But yeah, is it going to be better than, yeah, it'll probably be better than 80% of human generated content somewhere in the two-ish year range which is you know not good news for a lot of people um but Hans, there's a lot of bad content out there <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. mine included <laughs> uh, right there with you so yeah and it, it is wild the the thing that one of the other pieces about sword that's very interesting to me is it's one of the first examples of a fusion of two different sets of machine learning techniques. And so, you know, Tesla's been working a lot with transformers. And so transformers are like one architecture that you can use to do things in artificial intelligence. Explain what transformers are for the audience. It's used for large language models. And, and the way that they train is you take a big old fat block of text and you plug it in and then you like remove words or sentences or paragraphs somewhere throughout it. And so you kind of mask it, but you have like an overall framework and um, of context. And then you're trying to get it to fill in a blank spot in an overall structure accurately. And, and you keep repeating that over and over again and changing what words you cover up and what parts you take away um, until it's able to fill in a blank spot appropriately. Diffusion is the other method that's commonly used. And it is what something like Midjourney uses. And it kind of actually operates in the reverse method. And so for a picture, they'll start with, you know, an entirely blank canvas that's just initialized with basically noise. So it'll, you know, look like if you think back to old TVs, or if you aren't old enough to know what an old TV looked like when it was just noise on the TV, then watch videos of old TVs. Yeah. And it's just, you know, the black and white fuzz and in the fuzzy sounds. Um, so a, a diffusion model will start with something like that as the, the image that they're trying to generate. And then they will start seeding in that some actual, um, something to, to build on. And it'll have a prompt and say, you know, like generate me a fuzzy bunny. And so it'll start just randomly seeding the overall picture with some color bits. And then it's the job of the diffusion model now to generate and stitch together a complete whole that fits the prompt based on like something where you're basically starting with nothing and you're building out an entire thing that has to be cohesive and it has to meet the prompt. Whereas, um, yeah, the transformers are typically something where you have most of everything and you're just trying to fill in blank spots. Um, and what Sora is, is it's a fusion of transformer models with diffusion models. Um, and so this is one of the first times that we've really seen these two different AI tools put together and used seamlessly. And so to get an, a very interesting, useful um function out of that marriage of those two different ai methods is cool it, you know it's just a convergence of technology and we're constantly coming up with new techniques to build neural nets and this is to me a proof case that every time that we create something that's new and cool that it will have its own you know, use case where it's great as a standalone thing, but then there's also a whole nother set of possibilities where you can take that and you can marry it to something else and get a whole nother use case out of it. And so there's going to be this very long process of just engineering and trial and error and implementation as we develop new methods where we are just creating new things and then recombining everything that we create with everything that we've done in the past. Um, and so there's like a, a huge runway is what I see of possibilities to build new things in new ways um, for a long time. 
and to get incredible results in the, you know, all of this is running on top of a substrate of we're building more and more compute, like Moore's law is not stopping, it's accelerating. We're moving away from CPU into new formats of compute. And so we're, we're getting access to more synthetic computation over time. It's using less energy per cycle of compute, but obviously we're, you know, we're growing the amount of compute so fast that it's taking up a lot more energy. Um, and so we're, we're playing with software tools that are just growing in, in an exploding number of capabilities at the same time that we're growing these ridiculous synthetic computation abilities. And that those two things put together are just going to generate a, a ridiculous number of valuable uses that have never been possible before. Do you think OpenAI is going to be around to be to be a leading company that's going to get us there? Or do you think that they are a house of cards because of how, uh, and I say the word easy very in a very like not correct way, but because of how easy it is to get the models to be replicated, which we have proof for, like other companies can get there within a short period of time. And it really comes down to the data piece. And I don't know what data OpenAI has that would actually allow them to have some sort of advantage in the long term. How do you, how do you view that whole thing with how OpenAI fits in that puzzle? I think they are in a difficult position. I, you know, I think about the concept of things being Lindy and that the the speed with which you rise to prominence being essentially the same as the speed that it could take you to fall from prominence. So if something has the fastest rise in software history in chat GPT, like no product has ever been adopted as fast as that. Well, that also means that if something is better than it, it can be the fastest product to ever be unadopted. Um, because you know, it's last in first out kind of a thing. Um, so they, they are in a precarious situation there. They obviously have a lot of connections and a lot of people building on them and relying on them. They are a first mover in this space. And as they, you know, build out their GPT infrastructure for people to build GPTs on, you know, on their backbone in partnerships with someone like Microsoft to prop them up from a compute standpoint to be able to serve these um, AI functions to people. I think that helps solidify their ability to stick around. Um, but man, you know, obviously governance this last year has been a complete crap show. Um, I wouldn't trust Sam Altman farther than I could throw him. That dude is shady to the max. And like, you don't, convince people to give you $7 trillion or even attempt to convince people to give you $7 trillion if you don't have supreme confidence in your abilities to be a master manipulator of people. So quick, that's a real thing. So can we confirm that he's actually trying to raise $7 trillion? Because it, it sounds insane. Yeah, it, it sounds insane. Uh, it seems like it's confirmed that he's doing something big like that. In Somewhat understandably, because from what I have read, w the opportunity that they're really going after is to recreate the semiconductor supply chain, which is a big freaking supply chain and it's global and it's super fragile from a um, redundancy standpoint. It's all in Taiwan, right? The That's like the highest level. So like all of the... That's the um, aggregator, the person that's putting together a bunch of pieces. But there are chips that are, um, you know, machines that make individual wafers that are not necessarily something that's done at the TSMC level. Um, and then those machines have uh, dependencies on lenses for optical laser, you know, based stuff that these lenses are made by one company. So there's like several points in an entire supply chain of chip making 
where there's a single point of failure. TM, TSMC is one of those things since like 90 plus percent of chips get made there um, in Taiwan. That's a big one. But then there's other bottlenecks in single points of failure places. Prior to that, in the in the overall semiconductor supply chain, that are also at risk. And so, in order for the U.S. to have a completely domestic semiconductor supply chain, there's a bunch of things that have to get onshored beyond just doing what TSMC does. Like just trying to replicate what TSMC does here in the United States is a big problem. That's hard. Um, but then when you say, okay, not only that, but every single supplier that then feeds into TSMC from the sand up also has to be domestic. That's where you get to $7 trillion type numbers. Like it's a big issue. So it's, it's, so his justification is, is trying to secure the, uh, the ability to reliably have access to the hardware that's needed to develop these tools. That's the thought process there. Okay. Interesting. For the long term. For the long term. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. I mean, so there is merit behind it. It's just that number seems so otherworldly. But also, if you fast forward 10, 20 years in the future, and you think about cars being self-driving, you have tools that can generate uh, simulations of reality. Uh, you can have robots that do everything for you. What is $7 trillion in that context? <laughs> you know? So is is the economy starting to get weird already? There are definitely parts of the economy where people are thinking about numbers so big that what we have going on today seems like small potatoes. One of the things with OpenAI with me is that I'm trying to figure out if it's a house of cards or, or not because of that because of that data, you know? And I'm not saying Sam is not a talented individual. He very obviously is extremely, supremely talented. Uh, I mean, he headed uh, YC, Y Combinator, which has given you know way to a bunch of different awesome startups and companies that have coming out of there. And he seems to be loved by everybody at OpenAI, it seems. Um, so, but at, at the, in the same token, it's, it, you know, another thing about Sam too, is that he is a, he's very good at marketing. He is a supremely good marketer, like an extremely good marketer. And you know, he's done a really good job getting OpenAI to be almost the face of of artificial intelligence. Like when I think artificial intelligence, the first thing that comes to mind is OpenAI. Uh, even, even as somebody who follows Tesla very closely and I think about FSD and all that stuff and I understand, you know, you know the, the immediate impact that's going to have once that's turned on, I still think, oh, OpenAI, that's, that's the leader of AI. But in the same token, I'm just struggling to reconcile the fact that there are companies that will be able to develop what OpenAI is developing relatively quickly. They're not going to be that far behind. And again, it just comes down to data. So like, in my opinion, companies like Google, companies like X, companies like, uh, you know, Google owns YouTube, um, companies that are sitting on data, that's going to, that's really the, the crucial thing to get these models to work properly. Those seem to be the companies that are going to be the winners long term and not the company that's developing the, the 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 top layer, you know? Because if you think about it, it once, it, once OpenAI wants to gain access to the bottom layer, which is the data layer, to generate the results that people are looking for for whatever they're trying to do, immediately they're gonna be in a battle of, okay, so now they're gonna have to pay for access for that data. And you know, what's stopping these uh, quote unquote data providers now from either blocking OpenAI from doing that or charging fees where maybe it makes the case for open AI, like, like, for example, if I'm Google, right, and I'm setting all, all this YouTube data, which is video, audio, text, right? I mean, it's, it's a, it's a freaking gold mine of data. YouTube is like humanity is on there, everything. And so why would I ever give OpenAI access to my data when I can just layer Bard or whatever, you know, the Sora equivalent of Bard is and just make my own version of Sora and in about six months time and then I win. And then what does OpenAI have to offer after that, right? Uh, and the same thing with like X, you know, what's stopping uh, Elon from saying you don't have access to humanities or let's say Western society's uh, brain. So I'm going to cut you off from that 
and I'm going to get Grok to be whatever solution I want it to be. Right. And they're going to have video as well. So it's like they can be, a, you know, a YouTube competitor from that perspective as well. That's where I struggle to see OpenAI's long term future. Like I, what I'm not saying the technology isn't incredible. It obviously, is, but like where what happens in five, 10 years time? I mean, that's definitely a huge challenge that they have to overcome. And I think that's one of the reasons why they're looking at going you know, skipping down below the the data layer to the compute layer potentially and trying to come up with a hardware. And then, you know, if, if they own the hardware, then they can kind of secure everything in between. If, if they're the top and the bottom, they have a sandwich and that really secures their position a lot better and allows them to do other things. The other area for them to collect a lot of data is if they have a lot of these GPT agents that are being used heavily to perform actions on the internet, those agents themselves have the ability to gather and source and um, you know, accumulate and build up data, their own proprietary data stores as well. Um, so it's a source of data that they have. Uh, I mean, it just depends on on how they build them. But you know, if if you've got a GBT that lives inside of an API that goes out into the internet and it, you know, talks to a bunch of things and performs actions, you know, every single one of those interactions with something is a source of data of some form or another. Um, and, and they can store all of that. But what, what, what if, what if those, uh, places say no, you can't have access to it? Like, for example, if they're, they're trying to crawl Google or YouTube, right? That's what it will be one of the places they're trying to crawl, right? This wouldn't be to crawl. So I'm talking like, imagine you have a trip planning GPT that goes out and it talks to Google, it talks to Kayak, it, you know, talks to the airline company to buy you the things that as it's going out there and performing actions with you, well, it's obviously gathering data in the process of performing these actions. And all of that is kind of proprietary data to those individual GPTs. Um, so, so that's one source for them to be able to separate themselves or at least create, uh, provide value that's proprietary to how they're doing it, where they wouldn't get completely. So, so there is room for them to play. It's just, I, I guess where I'm going with this is like, I feel like the really groundbreaking stuff, they not, they would they wouldn't necessarily have access to because the companies that have access to that gold mine of data don't have an incentive to really give that data to anybody else but themselves because they could just build that thing on top of that data and they become the provider of those AI tools based that, that are generated from that data. Yeah, so the way that I think about that is in you know platform and UI interface shifts that all of the players that we're talking about, whether it's you know a Facebook or a Google or a Microsoft, even um, YouTube, you know, all these things like th these are existing data store, Cora, Reddit, um, you know, these are existing sources of high quality data that could be super valuable. But every time we go through a platform shift, whether it's, you know, there's a new form of internet browser ish thing, like the way that the internet operates. As you move to that, like if OpenAI can innovate on whatever that is, and they can lead and take market share and develop network effects in a platform shift, then that's an entire new opportunity for them to capture huge high quality data sources. Um, and, and so that's where I'm thinking about like, if the way that we interact with the internet becomes much more dependent on something like GPTs. Like just imagine a future where GPT web traffic accounts for 60, 70, 80% of overall internet activity. Then all of a sudden now their access to that data source, especially if they win the network effects and they, you know, if, if GPTs are 80% of web traffic and open AI has 60% of all GPT traffic and the 60% that they have is like 90% of the valuable GPT traffic. Well, then you see like a future for them that is swimming in super high valuable data. And it's, you know, the, the overall landscape and architecture of the web has changed such that 
that becomes not only very valuable, but like the most valuable and eclipsing things like YouTube that we have today. I see. Okay. So the, the way I think about that in my brain, like the simple ways, like they, they can be, they can, one of the, one of the use cases where they can separate themselves from everybody else is that they can be like the real, what Siri was supposed to be. Yes. And you know that Apple is working on, you know, everyone is going to be working on that problem. What the hell is Apple doing? For real. Working on the Vision Pro. That's their... <laughs> oh, man.